Hi there. This is Barbara hey. Bray, and I am with Hedrick Nichols. I almost said Nichols. Oh my gosh, I'm just, oh, what's wrong with me today? <laughs> you got Hedrick right. That's the good part, so I'm good with that. Hey, I know. Barbara. Oh, I just, I'm really excited to be with you, and, and we've been talking a lot lately. Yeah. yeah, we really have. It's been good stuff. It's really been good. Well, it's just that you know, there's so much going on right now with the pandemic, and now this it exposed so much that has always been there. We just never talked about it, mm -hmm. and so yeah. when we, it's been good. I, I've been glad. So we should let's just talk about what we've been uh, doing and sharing and what we wrote about. Yeah, I mean, I think that you know that's a, a a good segue to the whole being on a journey kind of thing, because for the black community, this is something we we live with all the time. You know what I mean? And there's sometimes this feeling, oh, now you see it? <laughs> oh, really? Now? And just, just that <laughs> yeah. feeling because it's something that we all live with every day. But I think that the just us, everybody being at home and paying attention, has made us more aware you know the things have been posting there's several elite colleges and prep schools across the country who actually have instagram sites you know black app and i won't put anybody on blast today but it's because <laughs> of the the low diversity campuses do not always treat their minority students well and if mm -hmm. you you know like i said it's always there but because we're all at home we're on social media everybody's got a TikTok <laughs> savage account and people are paying attention and, yeah. and not only has COVID exposed the inequities just in the way that things disproportionately affect minor the minority community, but also people are just on their phones all the time. So when things come up, people see them, you know, they're not so mm -hmm. much in their own little social media bubbles, just, you know, people are consuming mm -hmm. so much more information now. Well, this is, I'm going to talk about the phones because without the phones, we wouldn't have seen what happened to George Floyd or even Rodney King long ago. I mean, we've seen it. We just didn't react until this happened to George Floyd. And that was just, um, it's too bad because if it means that you have to wait till someone actually videos it, it's probably been happening. It's been happening all along. Mm -hmm. And um, we had to do something about this. We have to. And I, what I like is that you and I talked about what it means to talk from different perspectives, from the, mm -hmm. from your perspective and mine as a white person and where I grew up, what I went through. All of us have our different experiences and it's maybe sharing some things that are uncomfortable. I think it's so, it's so important. Um, we were talking also just about like we see the end goal the same but we have two very different experiences that have shaped us mm -hmm. and sometimes it's funny sometimes you're madder about stuff than i am <laughs> and I, fi I find that that's one of the things i, I kind of preach about or at least advocate for is that we don't get into the whole infighting woke woke or wokest thing because um some people are really just waking up to see what's going on but we do we have different different perspectives even though we want the same things and oftentimes need different spaces i think that's some of the one of the things we talked about in the uh, in the rethink learning chat just having um being okay with us having holistic spaces where we are all able to share together mm -hmm. and also having spaces where we can retreat into the black community into the white community and talk about you process things differently when someone says wow but I mean, I, of course we had we had black maids, and of course we had a, a Confederate flag in Daddy's truck. That's just how it was. <laughs> that is a statement of fact, unless you carry the wounds of the black community. In in which case, it feels like an affront. Yeah. And so I may or may not, depending on the day, I may or may not be able to react magnanimously and say yes i understand that was a part of your history however let's move forward um and if if i'm having not that good a day or someone is having not that good a day do you really think that's right and <laughs> do, you, do you really and so you get walls up 
Yeah. And yeah. so, you know, you need to have spaces where white people can say, you know, daddy always had a gun rack and a Confederate flag in his, in his, in his fork. I mean, that was just normal. I never thought of it, but I'm so glad I'm thinking of it now. And you need to be able to say that in a space where you don't get jumped on because how come you haven't seen that you should have changed a long time ago? Because people are hurting. So, yeah. yeah. Well, I'm glad we can talk about it now, but it's like there are still still people that one, they're very defensive. What do you mean? I'm a racist. What do you mean? You know? And the thing is, I was telling you about how I grew up because I didn't even know because all I had was around me were white people exactly. and, and grew up in school and whatever, but that didn't mean. And I, I told you where I grew up. I grew up in Silver Spring, Maryland, where I found out that they have a covenant to do the redlining and they actually started there and i had no idea but you know what Barbara? you are kind of this weird anomaly because you uh, you anomaly because you have that that you say you know I, I was raised in this bubble but yet you also were raised with this incredibly you know forward-thinking mother who you know was an advocate for people on death row accused unfairly who, and you went to marches and so so mm -hmm. you know how was it how was it for you growing up with that that duplicity i talk about mine being able being a black female growing up in the south in the serious mm -hmm. south where you know hey long live the confederacy you grow up almost with this this this, this just a very duplicity it's like there's a wall up between what you learn in school which you of course hear from the authorities mm -hmm. and what you realize oh my god but if the confederacy had won the war i'd still be picking cotton <laughs> so, <laughs> what, what, that's the truth it's and true. it was a long time before i realized because i was grow i grew up in a school system that glorified the south and the confederacy and i yeah. was talking about them quote unquote damn yankees excuse my french and that was a part of my cultural heritage as a southerner wow. and it was, uh, it was a long time before i woke up and said wait a minute hold up they were, they were, they might not have been, the North might have been the enemy of the South, but the South was my enemy. <laughs> and you were living it. I mean, yes. you know, okay. So I grew up in Maryland. Mm -hmm. Maryland is the South, even though it's. Right. Yeah. And I'm much older than you. And, uh-oh, I got to tell, I got to stop something for a minute. Wait, wait, hold on just a second. Okay, there we go. <laughs> um you know i i didn't even know some things that were happening at the time i told you that um i didn't have any black people around me but i had great teachers i had a teacher i think i was a uh, sophomore mm -hmm. um this is tell you how old i am <laughs> Um, who took us to the Martin Luther King, I have a dream speech. And I was, um, we were way back near the Washington Monument. And there was a lot of good discussions about this. And there were, we didn't have any black teachers. It was all, everything was white. Everything was <laughs> but at that point, I said, I want to know more. But I still was isolated very much isolated in in my life growing up there until we moved to California and that's where I saw more because my mother was a courtroom artist and then she was exposed her first her first trial was Huey Newton's trial which was the Black Panthers and yeah and she just kept bringing things home, she, telling, talking about it, telling stories. And uh, she wanted to fight for certain people that were incarcerated. One in particular was Rochelle McGee. Mm -hmm. And she has fought, wait, is that his name? I, I got to remember now. But anyway, he's still in jail after all this time for stealing bread or something. So my mother has always been, was an advocate. She passed away, but um, all the way up to her deathbed, she fought. And, um, but she see, I, like you said, woke up, it takes time to get it, that you can do something. Yeah. 
Yeah. You can do something. And she was exposed to it every day because of the trials and the, the different trials she did. She did Angela Davis, the George Jackson, the Solida brothers. She did all of those where I was getting married, having a little white life. You know what I mean? It, yeah. It's, but we moved to Oakland for a reason because I wanted to live in a diverse community. I wanted my children to understand and be part of that. And it's been wonderful. Okay. But I, yeah, but, Oakland. And, and I think we talk about that. A lot of teachers do. Um, they, they want diversity, but they live in one community and teach in another. Mm -hmm. And I, while I understand, um, I understand the wanting something for your family that a community might not be able to provide. I also advocate that if you live in another community that you should at least be a part of the community you teach in. And mm -hmm. if that's going to the little league games or mm -hmm. going to a local church service, hanging out at the local soul food joint, um, going to a Juneteenth parade that's yeah. coming this Friday. Yeah. Uh, in case nobody knows what that is, the quick history is that unfortunately in Texas and Louisiana, they wanted to get the crops out. So they kept slaves up until instead of letting us be free in January when the Emancipation Proclamation was signed, they made sure that we worked until June 19th. And that's why we celebrate that Freedom Holiday on June 19th and we call it Juneteenth. And 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 it's something so big that it wasn't in the history books right into yeah. it wasn't in texas history books or or what happened in tulsa wasn't in oklahoma <laughs> i mean it's like oh my gosh it, you it, know, Barbara, that's one thing that we were talking about that i really want to bring out too that we have to forget it's not history it's histories yes you know, that that's so important that we're exploring diverse perspectives you know what i'm saying the, you know the people who came over on the the nina and the pink and the santa maria did not have the same experience as, as the indigenous people of north america and if we are not teaching both of those sides then we are you know we're covering up a lot of trees and oh that's there's so many i mean it's i was a social studies teacher and then when you go and you look at what you taught, I mean, it was lies, lies, lies. The whole thing about reconstruction. Uh, it's just so sad that we, what I'm trying to do now is to learn, I'm reading. I'm, in fact, what we did in our, in the post that we created mm -hmm. uh, and the document is that we wanted to give people resources and help people. I mean, I've had some of my white friends say, oh, what can I do? And so all of us joined the NAACP. Oh, how cool. <laughs> how cool. You know that you are the second person this week who has said, I joined the NAACP. And I will say this as a, as a little girl, the NAACP was, because I'm a child of the 70s, so NAACP was, a, was still a very powerful and well-respected organization. And as we got a little more education, a little more wealth, we kind of, I, this is my feeling. I, I don't have any historical data to say this, but my feeling was that we moved away from it and largely because the word, you know, Negro, yeah. <laughs> was, or a nationalized of color people, Negro and colored were just those terms that were outdated, which made us feel like, oh, well, the organization is outdated. But they are still frontline, frontline workers have been for, for yeah. decades. And so thank you for that. That's pretty exciting. Well, I'm writing postcards and there's also a legal defense fund that they are really work. I really feel we need to um, donate to that. That and the Southern Poverty Law Center. There's some, yes. some things that we have to do to support this work. If we can't just talk about it. Yeah. And I mean, let's, let's be honest. There are some people who are really in circles where they feel uh, completely intimidated and unable to use their voice. I ain't mm -hmm. mad at you about a check. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, and Southern Poverty Law Center and the NAACP, if that's the only way that you can find a way to help or to, 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 to use your voice, if you are not in a circle where you feel comfortable to go stand out with your sign, then by all means, you know, we, we've, we've also gotten to a community where, well, don't just write a check. You have to do something. We have to be where we are. It's, it is a journey. Yeah. It is yeah. A journey. So as part of those journeys, what we wrote, which I'm really proud of what we put together. It's an amazing document. It is really just talking about the stages. Go ahead, go ahead. You were starting. Go ahead. Well, 
Okay, the first thing is the the different fa the stages of the racial identity, which we found that and um, that when I first saw it, I kind of was taken aback. You know, there was one part on reintegration, which I'll just read what it said. It said believing mm -hmm. that they may deserve deserve their white privilege and are superior. That's scary for me that people feel they're superior. And it's, it's that feeling that um, we can't, we're all human. 99.9%, .9 all of us are the same. The DNA is the same. Mm -hmm. And what happened? What? Well, that's, the, I think that's the whole thing. When people, when we say systemic racism, that sounds like this horrible, oh, what do you mean systemic? Everybody, life is unfair. I had someone tell my child recently, well, honey, life is unfair. Life's going to eat you up. You can't just get, get used to that. Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, oh. um, but it is a systemic problem uh -huh. because how can you go from saying, first of all, if you enslave people, you have to really say, uh, these are savages. You know what I mean? It's okay for me to have my dog go outside and use the, use the potty outside because that's what dogs do. They go outside and they use it out there. So I'm a human. This is a dog. That is my reality. And we had to do that. We, well, I'm sure I got some of that in my, in my background as well. Um, we had to do that we had to dehumanize indigenous people, for example, we had to dehumanize mm -hmm. the black slaves that we were take, bringing over to pack them in like cargo because if we didn't believe that they didn't have the same pain threshold or if we didn't believe that they had less in, uh, inferior intelligence and inferior re uh, capabilities of reasoning, we could never have done that. And well, if we couldn't have done that, gee, who was going to pick the cotton? I'm certainly not. And so it became mm -hmm. a, a, a horrible way to, to just self-preserve to preserve well, and that's still going on i mean this this idea of this white superior race which is an, it it is something that i mean i'm jewish so even during the holocaust they did that with the jewish people Absolutely. and with and gays and blacks and anyone that east you know, europeans yeah there is yeah. The whole othering is a social construct that makes yeah. me available to say that I am better than you are, which justifies me treating you poorly. And that's where you get the systemic part of racism. And you can't go from three-fifths, y'all are three-fifths, a man is three-fifths and women are just really chattel. And then <laughs> say, okay, we're equal. Nobody, you know, nobody, we don't do that. You know, that's why from women's suffrage to the 70s with Gloria Steinem and her fish and bicycle yeah. to now, we're sti we still see a pay disparity. Yeah. See, because I was, a, see, I know that all about that because during the 70s, I was in part of the white, you know, the, the women's consciousness raising, right. I, I was out there, you know, fighting for that. But it, it's like, it's, it's almost like it's sad that we had to go through this, this pandemic as awful mm -hmm. as it is. But it, it, I don't want to say it's woke us up, but it is waking us up in a way that we have to have these conversations. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I love that we put together was not only the resources, but we came up with some scenarios. Yes. Yeah, and so I shared this out with the, you know, my sisters and some friends. And, and some of them said, the try this, not this is really clear and helps and i've I, to me you know we we probably will add to this we can change it because we said this is a work in progress we're learning from this but some of the things people found is that um they didn't know what to say or they didn't know what to do or they what if they said the wrong thing <laughs> yeah i'm i'm working on a book um and i was going back and forth on with one particular part on uh with an educator i mean with, with the editor and she was saying i said you know don't this is something that you might encounter and i mentioned for example a child saying uh, a small child a second grader perhaps saying you know why why does alicia always wear a scarf and you know answering that in a very neutral factual kind of way and she wrote me back she said you you know add examples because people uh -huh. really don't think like you know and so that's why our document is so great because it says not only you might encounter this 
this is a scenario where you can stand up and use your voice and all those big concept words, but no, say this not that. So don't say, don't talk about it. Alicia has a scarf. That's her person. That's personal. It's her religion. Don't talk about it. And that's what we're so used to doing. We don't, don't say race, racism. No, race is not racism. That's necessary. And so you say, well, Alicia wears a hijab. It's out of respect to, to her religion and to her culture. Oh, okay. What's it called? A hijab. Oh, okay. And then kids go on and it becomes like, oh, what color do you want to paint your, your flowers? Red, green, purple, blue. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. not this. Well, thing. see, that's the thing. It's a culturally responsive training that all of us need. I mean, I, I love Zaretta Hammond's book. And uh, yeah, we, we, you know, we didn't put that in the document. I got to put it in the document. That's right. As well, yeah, as, so, well, there's a book study going on about it right now. Um, I know. Yeah, so, yeah. so what else? what we're doing is we and and we just wanted to kind of introduce the document but we also wanted to say that this is an ongoing conversation this is going to be the only time we talk or other people um hedrick is in a panel pretty soon next week and you're yeah and you're and and the other thing that you're, you're doing that is so amazing are the small bites and i love them and those what's really cool and i i'm hoping our audience you know calls into it it looks at looks at the document at the bottom of the document uh is a link to her youtube channel but it's every friday is it going to be just for five times or oh no it's it's every friday night at eight o'clock it'll drop as a matter of fact central already... time eight o'clock central time eight o'clock eight o'clock central time that's in texas y'all eight o'clock <laughs> central time <laughs> Uh, they will be posted. That was, I did the live launch and I'll have one uh, again at Christmas time for sure. Um, but before, but generally five minutes, I think it's five, 30 seconds, including your intro and your outro. So two to five minute videos with really just useful information, kind of like the, the things we talked about in the doc document, not yeah. concepts, use your voice fight anti, you be an anti-racist. Those are big concepts, but unless we break those down into actionable steps, they are not going to do any of us any good. So I'm just pulling this together. We're both pulling this together. And, and what I find is that I cannot do it alone. And I, I don't think any of us can do this alone. And we have to share resources and ideas. And that's the reason why we wanted to pull this document together and be able to talk about it with each other and i'm just so grateful to know you oh you uh, we have had such great conversations and i look forward to having even more it's funny the uh so they might the reason the listeners might want to know that we actually had a date going to a conference um right before covid hit as a matter of fact we were going so to go south by southwest i was going there with my book to find your why i was going to do all this stuff and we were going to celebrate together on the breakfast and and then it was Oh, should we, should I do it? I don't know. Maybe we'll cancel. And then suddenly everything just started spiraling from there. So, yeah, well, it, we're not alone in this, so I'm not going to take it personally. What I've found is that I've been able to connect with you so many ways and with other, other amazing people who are helping me because I'm learning and unlearning and relearning. And it's been a real journey that I needed to do. And I hope others keep, you know, come on board and more and more that they get it, that we're not alone in this. Yeah. And that, that's for us as well. I mean, for the black community as well, it's a time of, of healing and learning to use our voices and not just be silent. I was reading about one of those, um, one, a little girl, little girl, uh, a senior in high school who had always been afraid to speak out. She was at an elite prep school and she never wanted to say anything because she was afraid that she would come under fire. And so there are still so many settings that where we're afraid to use our voices, af afraid to speak up for what will happen. So I, I, we are also learning in the Black community to use our voices and to use them in a way so that we can be heard, so that we can all work together and, and move forward. Wow. Well, I'm going to end this on that. That was beautiful. Yay. Uh, thank you so much. This is thank you for having me, Barbara. It's been wonderful. Uh,
Thank you. All right. Thanks. We'll, we'll come back. <laughs> All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.